Doom is arguably the most influential FPS ever, defining the genre itself. Whilst it all started back in 1993, each successive title has pushed the boundaries of game design, audio and graphics. How has each title leveraged the technology of the time to push the envelope of what is possible? Let's find out. Rewinding the clock to 1993, the original Doom is a masterpiece of engineering. So let's dive into the guts of it. The first thing to note is that this is entirely a software renderer. It doesn't use a graphics card because back when this was released, computers didn't have dedicated graphics cards. This is why you see a lot of people running Doom on weird and wonderful hardware, because it doesn't require a dedicated graphics card. To put this in perspective, the minimum requirements for Doom was 24 megabytes of free hard drive space, 4 megabytes of RAM, and a 12 megahertz processor. That's a lot of megas in the world of gigas and teras. So the CPU has to figure out what each pixel value should be, 30 times a second, as well as running the audio and the game logic, etc. In order to maximise efficiency, Doom needs to ensure it makes the minimum number of pixel calculations possible. For example, it's a waste of time if it renders out a wall and then renders another on top of it later just because this one was closer to the player. This is called overdraw and reducing it is a theme throughout all the Doom games. So the game needs to efficiently work out every frame what the player can see and discard everything else. The main way the original Doom does this is with something called a binary space partition tree or BSP tree. That might sound complex, but really it's just a way of efficiently representing the 3D world that the player is in. In Doom, a level is created as a 2D grid, and then offline, so before the game is run, it is recursively subdivided into this BSP structure. What this ultimately allows the game to do is, given the player position and an angle they're looking in, get a list of all the possible rooms they might be able to see at that point. This allows the game to discard any rooms that they definitely will not be able to see. After that, it renders all the walls. I'm going to use this amazing clip from Fabian Sanglard to demonstrate this, but I've linked his blog post in the description as it has some amazing insights in it. It does some calculations to work out what texture the wall should have given the angle it's viewed at, and then it renders it column by column. Crucially, it renders all the walls from front to back, i.e. those closest to the player first. This again allows the engine to skip drawing any walls behind others that have already been drawn. Next comes the ceilings and floors, sometimes known as flats. The data for these are calculated during the wall rendering and are again drawn front to back to prevent overdraw. Now the flats are filled row by row and the walls are filled column by column. And as far as I can tell, this was a deliberate choice as every vertical slice of a wall has the same depth from the player and every vertical row of a flat also has the same depth from the player. So this reduces the amount of perspective calculations that need to be made. Finally, we have all the renderable entities enemies, ammo, power-ups, or affectionately known as things by the engine. Again, the engine does its best to discard any of these it knows the player cannot see, i.e. those behind them. Unlike the walls and flats which are rendered front to back to reduce overdraw, the things are rendered back to front. This is because they may have transparency, so they need to be laid on top of each other such that the final composition makes sense. I'm going to skip over Doom 2 through 64 because they're based on the same technology and I don't know enough about the internal workings of the N64 to be able to comment on any specific changes. Now skipping forward 11 years we get to Doom 3 which sees a seismic change in rendering technique and outcome. Your death is coming. Gone are the sprite based things, the column based wall fills and even the software render itself. Doom 3 required a dedicated graphics card, and as such, pushed the boundary of what was possible. Our minimum specs are now 1.5GHz processor, 384MB of RAM, and a graphics card with at least 64MB of memory. But the most crucial difference is that we can now look up. There were actually five rendering backends for Doom 3 to allow maximum support for the hardware at the time. However, I'll only be looking at the OpenGL one as that is the most relevant today. For anyone not aware, OpenGL is a cross-platform API for rendering. It basically defines a common language that all graphics cards will understand. So in theory, you can write your game once and it will then work on any graphics card. We can use a tool called API Tricks to log all the OpenGL calls the game makes. Importantly, this tool saves all the inputs and allows us to replay them later. 
So effectively, we can reconstruct the game frame by frame, and we'll do this to drill down into how Doom 3 does the rendering. So I've captured a bunch of frames leading up to the first in-game scene, and unfortunately, the way the tool works is that it plays them all back in real time. So I'll use some YouTube editing magic to cut out a lot of this waiting around. One thing to note about Doom 3 is that it is a thematically darker game, mixing in horror elements, and the decisions about how to render it definitely lean into that. For example, there is no ambient light. Everything is black by default, unless it is influenced by light. There's a lot that goes into a single frame, both on the CPU and GPU side. To start with, we need to discuss the graphical features of Doom 3 so that we can then look into its implementations and optimizations. At the end of the day, if you want to render realistic graphics, you need to simulate light as realistically as possible. Doom 3 uses per pixel lighting, which means the light affecting the final scene is calculated for each pixel in the image. So for a simple scene at 1080p, that's 2 million calculations. And if you want multiple lights and complex scenes and all to render 30 times a second, you can see how the amount of work the graphics card has to do starts to add up. So the life of a Doom 3 frame starts off on the CPU where the engine calculates every possible entity and light that the player might see. In addition to that, it also calculates which lights affect which entities, and these are called interactions. The reason for this is to aggressively cull anything the player cannot see, as there's no point in paying the price of having the GPU render it if the player will never see it. The way lights are rendered in Doom 3 is called multi-pass. This means that for each light, the graphics card renders the entire scene again and adds the influence into the final rendered image. This is where the interaction list is important. If the engine knows an enemy cannot be influenced by a particular light, then it doesn't need to submit those draw calls to the GPU. In essence, the engine has tried to minimize the number of draw calls because each OpenGL call has a cost. So now on the GPU side, the first thing it does is render the scene, but without any shaders, lighting, or actual color out. All it does is fill in what's called the depth buffer, which shows how far each pixel is from the camera, with black being near and white being far. This might seem strange, but the depth buffer is used for all the remaining render passes, and it can be used to discard unnecessary per pixel calculations. Looking at this as a concrete example, we have this box here, and there's actually a light here. When the game comes to render this light pass, it will need to do a calculation per pixel on the, all the geometry within its influence. But all the pixels here are hidden by this box, so this would be wasted work by the GPU as later on when it renders this box it will overwrite them. By using the depth buffer, the graphics card knows that any pixels in this area related to this geometry won't be seen by the player as the depth buffer says that there's something else closer, so it skips these pixel calculations. And here we can see each light pass being calculated, which creates the final scene. And now we take a hop, a skip and a jump to 2016 with the release of Doom. Not to be confused with the 1993 Doom. And now there's a slight different approach to my research. The original Doom and Doom 3 have both been open source, so it's easy to see what's going on. Both New Doom and Doom Eternal have not been open sourced, so we can only really go off what we can observe with debugging tools and a few details released by the developers. So New Doom has two rendering backends, one for OpenGL and one for Vulkan, which is a more modern replacement for OpenGL. The differences between OpenGL and Vulkan are the subject for another video, however the high level summary is that Vulkan is much lower level and leaves much more up to the developer to handle, however this increased flexibility allows for much greater performance. I'm using a tool called RenderDoc to capture a single frame from the Vulkan renderer, and I'll try to break it down and explain what's going on. So here's me playing for a bit and trying to line up a nice shot to capture. Wasn't expecting this barrel to fly out and punch me up the brackets, but it's still a cool scene. The first thing it does is update the mega texture. This is an optimization which creates one massive texture, in this case, 16,000 by 16,000 pixels wide and stores all possible textures needed for the scene. In fact, if we zoom in, we can see various different textures that might be needed. Some of these look like enemies, some of these look like parts of the environment, lots of different stuff. Obviously, what textures you need for a scene changes as the scene changes, so this step is updating them based on details from the previous frame. Next comes the shadow maps. 
This is a collection of all the views from all the lights that cast shadows. Effectively, this is putting a camera where every single light is and then rendering the depth of the scene from that light's perspective. The engine cleverly only updates the lights that had an object move into their view, i.e. will have a shadow that's changed, otherwise it just remains the same from frame to frame. It, then it will then use all this to project shadows into the scene from each light. And now we start to render out the depth and the velocity information, starting with the player's hand and the gun. The velocity information is interesting. Rather than rendering colour, it renders how far the pixel has moved since the last frame. With green representing horizontal movement and red representing vertical movement. So here we can see the gun was moving across the screen. This is all done so that later on the game can calculate realistic motion blur as it knows how much each pixel has moved from the preceding frame. And now we render out the depths of all the static geometry, i.e. the parts of the scene that never move. Again, we do all this to prevent overdraw for any pixel shaders. After that comes the depth and velocity information for the dynamic parts of the scene, i.e. those that are moving. You can see my barrel traveling up and across the screen. It then converts the depth buffer to a red-only image and scales it down. This is used in later calculations, but takes up less space on the GPU and is more efficient to work with. Now we get to the real meat and potatoes, actually rendering the color. There's a few things to unpack here. First, in addition to the color, it also renders out the normals, i.e. the direction each pixel is facing in the world, and the specular map, which says how shiny each pixel is. These are used for later post-processing steps. The color step looks a bit strange, but it's because it's rendering in high precision. It gets mapped back to a standard color range later, but at the moment it has more details than we can easily display. But the most interesting part is that all the shadows and multiple lights are all handled in this single pass. In Doom 3, the CPU calculated a list of all possible light and entity interactions. But the problem with this is that you still have to issue a draw call per entity per light. Doom breaks the camera view down into clusters and for each cluster creates a list of lights that will affect it. And these are then uploaded to the GPU. When the GPU comes to render a pixel, it works out which cluster it's in and then goes and gets the list of lights affecting that cluster and loops over them all in one pass. And this feedback buffer is used to tell the engine which parts of the mega texture need updating in the next frame. Building on the concept of getting the GPU to do more work, the next step is a compute pass, which means get the GPU to do some calculations rather than rendering. In the list of inputs, we can see particle input draw args and particles. So traditionally, a particle system represents a single particle as a position and a velocity. Then each frame, you update the position based on that velocity, possibly removing or adding new particles as needed. And then you render an image at each particle position. Now, even with multiple cores, this doesn't scale very well on the CPU and it can bottleneck it pretty quickly. What Doom is doing is getting the GPU to do the particle simulation, which is something a massively paralyzed bit of hardware loves to do. Doom takes this one step further though by also passing in our optimized depth map and our normal map. What this allows the GPU to do is work out where other objects are in the scene relative to each particle. So from there, it can make things like bounce off walls and have basic collision detection. And this is something that's impossible to do on a CPU. Next comes the ambient occlusion or AO pass. A -O, let's go. Basically, this takes the depth and the normal layers and approximates how much of the natural scene light reaches each pixel. The point being that creases and corners will trap light and should therefore be darker. And you can see that in the gaps between the sun and the gun and along this beam here. This is then used in a post-processing step later to darken these areas to give it a more realistic look. Now we render out all the particles. This ensures they are coloured and lit appropriately for the scene. And now we render all the particles into the scene. A separate target is used to render all the UI elements one by one, and this will be later composited onto the final image. Next, a technique called Bloom is applied. This takes all the bright parts of the scene and blurs them and then adds them back in. The end effect is that the bright areas bleed slightly into the surrounding pixels, giving a more realistic image. All our post-processing effects, including colour correction, are now all combined together. And finally, our UI is composited on top of the final image. That's a lot of work that goes into a single frame, and it's being done 60 times a second. The way I view Doom Eternal is a refinement of Doom, 
Not the original 1993 Doom, which obviously showed some improvement, but Doom 2016. The engine can handle more complex meshes, more textures, and generally do more in less time. One of the notable changes in Doom Eternal is that it goes all in on Vulkan, with the developers claiming they removed over 1 million lines of code by deleting the OpenGL backend. So I've played around and I've captured a frame, however as this is the latest iteration it also has the least amount of information available about it, but there should be enough here to see what improvements have been made. The first thing that we notice is that there is no mega texture anymore. This technology had several issues with image quality and a lot of that stemmed from the fact that each frame had to tell the next frame the changes, so you're always a frame behind. Instead, Doom Eternal uses something called bindless textures. This is where you upload all the textures you want at the quality you need to the GPU and the pixel shaders just access them via an ID. First up is the shadow mapping, which is pretty similar to the previous game. Next we have the depth and velocity render. Again, this is very similar to the previous game in that the player and the gun is rendered first and then the static elements and then finally the dynamic ones. An interesting thing to note here is that because Doom Eternal has larger, as in like physically larger areas to render, it does what's called reverse depth buffering in that white is now closer and black is further away. This allows for greater precision over a longer distance. A difference we can see here compared to the previous Doom is that there is a lot more being rendered. The scenes are much more complex with many more elements in them. Now this pass should be for the decals, which are things like nuts, bolts, ribbons, stains, any textual detail that an artist wants to add into the scene. For some reason, RenderDoc is just showing me a black screen, but I found a screenshot from a talk by the developers which showcases what I want to talk about. Basically, each of these colour patches is a decal placed by the artist and the colour is an index into the list of decals. So an artist can simply scale, rotate and translate one of these colour patches and the engine will load the right texture. And as you can see, the engine supports quite a lot of decals, which gives the artist a huge amount of flexibility in the scenes that they create. And here we have the ambient occlusion pass done entirely in a compute shader. Notice that it isn't rendered simply in black and white anymore, uh, but actually in colour. Uh, this is because it uses a more sophisticated technique which also encodes directional information of the pixel for more accurate results. Next comes the actual scene rendering. Uh, I believe the clustering and culling is way more advanced in this engine, offloading even more to the GPU. And again, it's rendering way more meshes. Then comes the particle rendering. What I find interesting is that even this lightning bolt in the background is a 3600 triangle mesh. So we've come quite a long way since the original Doom. Again, like the previous Doom, we render each UI element one by one into a separate buffer. And finally, at the end of all this, again, like the previous game, we do the post-processing effects and the UI composition. I just want to point out that as part of the research for this video, I read a lot of blog posts and articles, and I've linked them all in the description in case you want to dive deeper. Despite all the changes between each Doom game, one thing remains consistent. I am terrible at them all. <sighs> However, four years after the original Doom was released, a childhood favourite of mine was also released. So if you want to see how I reverse engineered the networking for that game, then check out this next video.